Very few cars have the heritage to become a brand within a brand. In the world of endless products, most companies can only dream of creating an icon like the Twinkie, the Walkman, or the Pontiac Sunfire. For a obtainable car to become a household name these days, it would either have to print money or cure cancer, neither of which the 2015 Ford Mustang has to do. Because let's face it, it has 50 years of history behind it. Nostalgia aside, this is the first modern Mustang to have captured my attention in quite a while. Let's see if it can keep it. I've been asked recently what I thought about cars like the Ferrari or Bugatti, and my straight answer is really, who cares? Because in the real world, these vehicles serve no practical purpose, and essentially they're only available to the one percenters like Justin Bieber or Kim Kardashian. So why would I rather talk about a Mustang over let's say a Lamborghini? Simple, Ford has made a car that normal people can afford, that's not only relevant, but it's obtainable. Ford knew for their 50th anniversary Mustang, they had to make some bold changes. Not only trying to connect the past with the present, but just making a more modern vehicle. And they've done that by talking to owners and just really looking at what people wanted now. But the one thing I can tell you is, if you've listened to any of the engineering stories or listened to the design stories for this car, they stressed on every part of this exterior, the rear haunches, these rear sheet metal curves, this fastback design, they wanted to make this a striking, bold, standout design that's pretty much distinguishable from any angle. This is one of the first cars I've seen at any price point where you can look at this thing and know it's a Mustang, you know it's a Ford, and that's really hard to do today in modern cars. We can go on and on about engineering and design, but the musculature of this Mustang is really unparalleled, especially from anything I've videoed recently. The highlights, lowlights bring out details that you normally don't see. You kind of find something different in every angle and it really comes out on video well. There's a couple things that really stand out here for me aesthetically for this Mustang. The first thing is these triple LED bars in the headlights that also carry over into the taillights and that's really key there, they tie that together. The other thing is the 19 inch wheel and tire combo here. These black wheels look so good on this dark blue paint that I, I wouldn't have it any other way, honestly. Well, not everything's perfect because there's plenty of panel gap here. One of the annoyances of this tester, at least, is the driver door is not really flush with the rear quarter panel. And you can actually see uh, that step when you're looking in the side view mirror. And it's kind of like, I thought the door actually got hit at first, or it could just be out of alignment. I'm, I'm not sure. Scott. We got two Mustangs here today. A Ford Mustang GT with a performance pack or track pack. What is it called, technically? The performance pack. The performance pack. Mm, what's the performance pack? The performance pack includes such features as <laughs> six piston Brembo front calipers. It also includes these specialty wheels that are about 60 pounds a piece with the tires to fit over these performance brakes. The other thing that's uh, performance pack includes, Scott, is the uh, springs and dampers have been revised to give you that extra bit of control, performance. 
One of the things when you get under the Ford GT Mustang, Scott, compared to the EcoBoost is you'll notice right away that the front aero diffuser is more performance oriented. Yeah, because it's got some air ducts. Yeah, it's got these uh, air ducts. Air duct, diverters. Air diverters, right. And then it's got flappers. Yeah, it's got full force air flappers that redirect air onto these massive steel rotors. So how big are, you know, we, these brakes are huge. Mm -hmm. How big are they? 15 inch. What are you going to do with 15 inch brakes? Have cool brakes when you stop at the stop signs at the grocery store parking lot? True. But what about the drag strip? It's a throw parachutes out the back for. No. Do they have a parachute kit for this car? Sure. We'll have to do an install on that. It'd be easy. So you're going to go from like 30 down to zero with the, just deploy the parachute? I don't think they'll work under 30. Well, you just have like a propulsion system to blow the parachute out so it looks like it's... Oh, so it looks the part? Yeah. You do that while someone's riding your ass. <laughs> yeah, blow the parachute out. <laughs> uh, the front suspension is just a standard strut-based front suspension. The only difference here that Ford did is it has a dual ball joint configuration. And the reason they added dual ball joints in the front is to be able to support these massive brakes that they're putting on. And obviously, there's, it's a reinforcement as well. It's supposed to give you more direct feel, uh, although that doesn't Why isn't there an upper ball joint? Because you don't need an upper ball joint with a strut suspension. But why wouldn't they go with that on this here performance car? It's a really good question. So in the front of the GT performance pack, you get this K-brace, which just reinforces the front end, which probably with the weight really helps here. Mm -hmm. Uh, you're pushing about 3,800 pounds curb weight with the GT. Uh, I think the only other thing to note here is in terms of adjustability, again, we don't have sus suspension adjustability in terms of alignment. One of these things when you get into a sports car territory that you'd actually like to be able to tune that type of stuff. All you get is toe adjustment here, front and back. So, you know, you're going to be going aftermarket suspension if you want to do any type of custom alignment. Uh, anyway, so we get in the back here. And the performance pack offers a couple other additions from the regular GT. That is a larger rear sway bar. Uh, you have a Torsen limited slip differential in the back. And what did you say the gears were back here again? 373. Okay. Uh, you have this new independent rear suspension. And there is use of aluminum here. Uh, this is a big step forward for really the Mustang. It's been a while. The past three generations of Mustangs I drove I mean, you know, you, you're still hard on this car. Like, I think driving it, there's some ride issues with it, I think, overall. But um, this is a big step forward for them. <laughs> <laughs> for them, yes. Everyone else has been doing it for... Yeah, I mean, this is, this is a big deal for Ford. But in terms of the industry, they're, they're really the last to adopt this. So, I mean... While it's a, it's a big deal, it's not as big of a deal as it really is made out to be. But in terms of the Mustang, it does improve the rear end feel a lot. It improves the overall drivability of it. So Scott, we're under the tried and true, well, maybe not so tried and true, Mustang Ecotech. EcoBoost. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> the EcoBoost, I lost. EcoTech just left. Oh yeah, that's right. It's the EcoBoost Ford Mustang. This is their four-cylinder turbo implementation, and there is so much debate, so much discussion about putting a four-cylinder in a Mustang. This isn't the first time it's been done. It's not going to be the last time it's done, that's for sure. What do you think? What do you think about it? It's a four-cylinder. Can't get past that. I, at first, I was going to say, you know what? I disagree with that. But now I, I kind of, being in both cars, this just it, it makes sense in a way but it doesn't make sense ford in 64 when this car first launched they had three engine options much like the 2014 and 15 does you have v6 the four banger turbo and the gt five liter so what they're trying to do is they're trying to make this car accessible to everybody well to people that work at least right you have an entry level model which typically has been pretty bad for the for the mustang this is much better oh, than their yeah. entry level Mustangs have ever been. So if you're in the market, you want to get in the Mustang because it still looks good. You know, four cylinder side from the outside, this car looks really sharp. As long as the windows are shut, it's fine. Right. The front end of this car, Scott, we have a different front diffuser and it's more for efficiency. Uh, 
you have this front lift that helps flow air around the front instead of you know flowing air to cool off brakes and such. And it's got this little chin spoiler. Yeah. And that one doesn't. I would go with that one. I want to get cooling on my brakes. Well, yeah, and, and honestly, for what you're really getting here in terms of, I mean, your fuel economy, yes, it's better than the GT, but for a four-cylinder, you're still barely breaking 20 miles per gallon if you're driving it like a regular person. Oh, I didn't drive it like a regular person. What so did you drive it like? Like an asshole. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, there are some aero treatments here for efficiency versus performance. Overall, the front end, we still have the dual ball joints in the front hub to accommodate larger brakes. Uh, you have a strut-based front suspension, and your overall, in terms of maintenance, things are a little bit easier to get here, mm -hmm. get, get at, obviously, because you have a huge, much bigger space here under the hood and underneath to work on it, uh, just due to the smaller size of the four-banger. The actual brakes on the front of this are four-piston Brembos, which they're not labeled Brembos, but they actually came off the old Mustang GT performance pack, which are now standard on the regular Mustang GT. And you have to pay more to get the GT brakes on the four banger model as well. And what did you notice right away back here? The vibration dampers, isolators, whatever you want to call them, some cones. Why do you think they put that on this car compared to the V8? Because it's a four cylinder and it vibrates. Yeah, that's. And I'm sure there's more than just those two. Yeah. But other than that, really, this looks very similar to the GT, mm -hmm. even right down to the differential. Now, the gearing is different. What's the gearing in here? 355. And that's part of the performance pack for the four-banger model. So the negatives are you're going to have to deal with some heat issues if you're really driving it hardcore. The intercooler is really small. It's essentially junk. It works in terms of efficiency. It works, but it heat well, soaks it so like fast. There's plenty of room up there for... Yeah, you could gearing. easily. There's plenty of space for that. So, you know, if, if you're looking at this from a performance perspective, this is set up as a daily driver. It's good if you're just putting around town, but whenever you start to push that past that envelope, you're going to deal with cooling. We talk about direct injection issues on a lot of cars in terms of maintenance, and the EcoBoost Mustang has had some initial issues with... Oh, yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, so... And the original fix was just put a new cylinder head on it because right. there's no approved repair for it right? or cleaning methods. And this is something especially that direct injection without port injection has problems with. Intake valves get dirty. You got to clean them. Most dealerships now have machines to do it, as we're finding out. To, to be, it's become a maintenance mm -hmm. issue. The big deal is those are on eco cars or cars that are not driven hard. When you have a car like the Mustang with direct injection and a turbo on top of it, it's going to be even worse. That blow by is going to be insane. Mm -hmm and oil temperatures get hotter, that vapor keeps blowing back and through the intake manifold. And I think it was what, cylinder two had a big issue in terms of... Right, because that's right where all that stuff was. Right. Yeah. So that's something to note. If you're driving flat out, you're gonna know that you're gonna have to do extra maintenance on the four banger with direct injection because of the turbo. And what do they get for cleaning the intake valves on one of those? Oh, it's I think six hours labor at a minimum, and depending on how bad it is. And they were doing cylinder heads under warranty. Right, the, when it first was happening. Right. Because they didn't know what to do. Or yeah. they didn't want to believe you have to blast it with walnut shells. It's ridiculous. The other real aftermarket answer is a catch can. Right. But it should, I'm sorry, they should just put it on the car. Right, it should be on there. But if you're an owner, an enthusiast, and oh, you're driving that car, junk. balls to the wall all the time, and you're going to keep it, probably, you're, you know, have a, you're financed. You're going to want to look at catch cans, a dual catch can system to catch the breather and the PCV line so you're not following up those intake valves until there's a better fix for it. I don't think there is a better fix for it. All right, Scott, what do we got here? Five point slow. This is a real 5.0. Yes. It's huge. It is very big. Well, it's two, four, four cams. It looks monstrous under here. That's why I was just showing them that. Look at the valve covers on that compared to this. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it's ridiculous. The perception of this motor, and it's dubbed the Coyote motor, is it is essentially one of the best five liters or best V8s on the market in terms of reliability. There's not a ton of problems, even with people modifying the hell out of them so far. And that's a really strong, strong bonus here if you're looking at a car like this. The other thing about the GT, Scott, is it's got a sound tube. I don't really mind sound tubes. You know, at first I'm like, this is stupid but it's kind of the modern age intake, right? Without putting an intake on the car. That doesn't make sense to me. But you're plumbing actual 
harmonics from the motor into the, the cabin of the car without faking well, I, it. I would rather, who wants to hear the intake? When don't you, they should plumb exhaust into the car. But then you hear it from the outside of the car. No, then that would happen while you're driving if you had exhaust going in the car. Well, no, I, oh yeah, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't catch that. <laughs> You get in some of these four cylinders with sound tubes and it just sounds so synthetic and it sounds like it's trying to be something it's not. This is so subtle, it just amplifies the already good sound to it. I guess, yeah, there you go. If it has a good sound, it's gonna sound good. If it's a four cylinder, it's only four cylinder. Right. <laughs> yeah. Which one would you take? The GT? The V8, of course. Yeah. I have to How agree. can't we even ask that? Well. Which one would you take? No, I wouldn't take that. But if I didn't have the money, this still has a lot of good potential in it. Right. Or There's... what would you take, this or the Miata? One of the problems with quiet cars, especially luxury cars, is you get one rattle or creak and it will absolutely drive you insane. Now, the Mustang's not a luxury car, but it is a quiet cabin. And the one thing that remains unchanged for this car, in my experience, is there is a symphony of rattles and creaks and vibrations and buzzing throughout the cabin. You go over any type of road turbulence and you hear it all around you, from the back deck to this front interior vent trim at the top of the dashboard here. I'm constantly having to push it down to avoid the buzzing that comes from it. It gets really old really fast. Now, I'm driving in sport mode. I don't turn track mode on the street, although I have tested it. Uh, sport mode just kind of changes some of the settings, the throttle settings, the steering setting. I actually turn off sport mode on the steering because I feel it's so artificial that I prefer comfort mode in the steering feel. I know that's kind of weird, but let's check out the turns here. Brakes are immense. You would never guess this is a four cylinder, ever. It, it has so much pull, so much torque in the low end. Uh, until you really start to rev it out, uh, that's where you notice that, okay, hey, this isn't, it doesn't have the extra displacement, but uh, it's got a lot of pull. Try this out. I'm gonna flip the traction control off here for a second to check out some of the acceleration here with uh, the power getting cut on us. The acceleration is uh, it's better than I expected, honestly. Uh, I've heard a lot of people say, well, it doesn't feel like it wants, it doesn't want to rev. Um, you know, it feels anemic because of the weight. Uh, I think this is kind of a, a really good balance for a street sporty car. You have a really good foundation with power here. And as soon as you learn that you shift this car in the power band, you don't, you just don't bang it off the rev limiter like a naturally aspirated car. It drives a lot smoother. <laughs> The actual uh, driving enjoyment's better, and it's tuned specifically for daily driving. <laughs> I'm not used to how strong the brakes are in this Mustang. I mean, they are really, really potent and almost overkill in terms of sensitivity on the street, but it always gives you confidence that you can pull yourself out of a real nasty situation you got in. This transmission, yeah, this is really good. Uh, this manual gearbox is exactly how you would expect a manual gearbox to be. Let's check out the last section here. 
man, when that turbo just kicks in, there's so much torque. Ugh. Doesn't feel too good over the uh, tracks there. When you're nailing this thing through the corners, you realize, especially on the street, you realize how important that low RPM torque and power tuning and delivery is. Because typically on the street, you're not going to be downshifting to max RPM all the time, especially in the turns. So like that last segment there, it, it totally highlights why this tuning is so important. Because you may not be in the right gear, I might be in third instead of second, coming uphill or out of a turn, and normally where you're like, oh man, I should have been in second, there's so much power and torque there to pull you out, it's almost like you, you don't even need to grab a lower gear, and that's part of why the tuning's like this for the street. It makes a lot of sense. The other thing to talk about in this price range specifically for a sporty car is if you're looking at the EcoBoost Mustang, you're probably out to, to save some money or you're looking for the efficiency of a four cylinder. Either way, when you're dealing with sports cars in this price range, you get a couple different types of formulas. You get the FRS and BRZ, which has an overly dampened ride to give you that sporty sensation. And the sacrifice is it's really firm on some of the choppy pavement. The Mustang here, uh, this kind of takes the opposite approach. There is a lot of compliance in this chassis. There's a lot of vibration damping. There's a lot of suspension travel. Uh, and it's not necessarily a bad thing because if you're using this as a daily driver, it's not gonna beat you up. Uh, like the, the railroad tracks we went over, there's a little bit of an excessive amount of slop there. It's not a very overly controlled feel. But again, it, it transmits enough into the cabin to let you know what the car is doing without beating you up. Now here's the thing about a four cylinder Mustang. When you almost rear end a Chevy cap, oh my God, damn. <laughs> he didn't have the arrow, girl. When you're driving in traffic and you're stuck behind people that really don't know what they're doing or just sharing the road with other drivers, you realize right away, it doesn't matter if you have a four cylinder, a V8, a V12 or a W16, because all that power means nothing unless you can fly. You are stuck like everybody else. For daily driving with a four cylinder, you do get that efficiency. You do get better fuel economy. On average, I'm seeing in the low 20s when I'm not beating on it. When I'm beating on it, uh, the worst really I've gotten is about 19 miles per gallon. And that's really hard to do uh, with a heavyweight, high displacement car, high horsepower car. So you do get the efficiency here. Here's my biggest issue with this Mustang. And you're gonna hear this a lot from other people, I'm sure. It's the steering feel. It's non-existent. And really, this is almost unexcusable to me in a sports car or a sporty car. This is the only way you can control the vehicle. This is your primary input. Hence, it should be the most important thing during engineering and design. Now, maybe Ford did put a lot of energy and effort into improving it or focus on it, but it doesn't translate, at least to me, on, on any road or any surface. Now, their solution to steering feel is by having this steering feel toggle selector between normal, sport, and comfort. Now, this is something that I saw in the Kia Soul EV, and the effect is very similar. It reminds me of tuning my Fanatec steering wheel for like iRacing or something. It, it essentially changes the linearity of the steering wheel, the force feedback, or the actual force that's in the wheel to turn. So like when you're in sport mode, it's actually the most synthetic feeling because all you do is it takes more effort to turn, but the car doesn't really turn, it's not more direct. I found that when I switch to comfort mode, it's actually a lot more direct. It, it changes direction when you steer the wheel. As I turn it into sport mode, yeah, the steering effort's changed, but it's slower to respond to my inputs, which is really annoying. I'd like to see them just get rid of this or you know, maybe leave it, but put more effort into tuning the mechanical linkage between the steering wheel, the steering rack, to the wheels. We still have mechanical linkages there. It's not completely disconnected yet. There's got to be a better way to do it than this. 
the last order of business, the sound. And this is not a Ford EcoBoost issue. This is a four banger issue. It's impossible or nearly impossible to make a four cylinder sound good in a street car or production car. There's very few motors. People are like, wow, that's a great sounding four cylinder. And this motor is a lot of the same. When you first hear it, you're like, it doesn't sound like a four cylinder. It sounds a lot more tough or deeper, but you realize in short order that this is all kind of a synthetic reproduction through the speakers. They are playing a tone over the engine sound to give it more of a growl, a, a tougher sound. And then you hear kind of some of the intake noise coming through the cabin as well. And sometimes, especially in downshifts, you hear this burble or just kind of like weird sounds that don't sound good at all, honestly. It's something I could totally do without in here, specifically the sound reproduction, the synthetic noise through the speakers. It just, it doesn't do it for me. All right, so we're gonna, we're gonna take a look and see how the GT handles the turns and the wet. Uh, you can tell when you have a lot of power, this becomes a frightening experience. Oh my God. This is where, if you're not adept, this car will bite you very fast. And this is something that you take for granted with big power is there becomes more uh, just driver skill needed to control it, especially when you're in conditions like this. Now, yeah, it can be all fun when you're in the dry, but this is where the big difference comes in between a car like the EcoBoost and having all this horsepower here. You have to manage it. You have to be responsible with it, or you're gonna wind up wrapped around a pole. Take a look at the acceleration here, which is not going to be much in the wet. This car just wants to lose its rear end all the time. And part of this is, you know, you have run flats on this car that aren't particularly the greatest. Uh, it's just overwhelming power and torque. You can really understand why all the electronics and nannies are in cars like this now. It, it can really save your ass. Again, driving the GT, much like driving the EcoBoost, is very similar when you're not mashing on the throttle. The transmission's extremely good, it's direct. Uh, the throttle is sharp. Overall, the main difference here when you're just cruising along is fuel economy. There's no, I mean, there's no comparison. This car does not get very good fuel economy, especially if you have a heavy foot. You can see the MX-5 in front of me here, uh, how it just starts to pull away even though it has, you know, literally a third of the power because it's able to get traction. This car just cannot get traction in the wet and if you are starting to push it, you just feel the rear end skating around so much. It becomes a almost futile, futile effort. I have almost zero confidence in pushing this car. I mean, it just wants to go sideways at every little twitch. The other thing you realize about a car with, you know, any high horsepower car in general, but specifically the GT, you go through first and second and third, and within four or five seconds, you realize you're pretty much at excessive speed. The fun's over really quick. Yes, you get up to speed fast, 
but you can't have a lot of fun with getting in a lot of trouble in this car. So that's another negative aspect, namely for a street car. You want the V8. It's exactly what you want in this car, but at the same time, it's just, there are a lot of trade-offs to deal with from fuel economy to just overall getting in trouble to dealing with just the ass end of this car being all over the place, especially in the wet. There are some trade-offs, but I think most people are going to settle for having this. It, it, it's the risk, it's the danger, it's the fun that just makes this car so compelling to drive. What is it like getting inside the Mustang? Well, whether you have the EcoBoost or the V8 version or V6, whatever version you get, if you have the Recaro option or you're thinking about the Recaro option and you have the body to fit these seats, they are excellent. They're worth every penny and I wouldn't buy this car without them. Now, if you're a big person, I'm, you know, I got a six year old boy body and I'm only about 145 pounds. These, these seats are snug, they fit me perfectly. So if you're a big boy, you're gonna wanna get to the dealer and try them out before you make any type of commitment financially on them. When you get in this car and you look ahead, you realize just how monstrous this hood is, how big the front end is. From the outside, you may think this is like a Cadillac interior in terms of size, or well, an old Cadillac. It's not. This is an extremely fitted cabin. It almost feels like a two-seat car. And that's exacerbated by the fact that these back seats are almost completely worthless. While they are really nice and comfortable, you have to have these front seats up all the way to just kind of feel like you're not in a tuna can in the back. I did a ton of research on the Mustang. I kind of had to. This car's been around for 50 years, longer than I've been alive. So knowing what they, what they did from the start and what they're trying to do now, this interior makes a lot more sense than it, it didn't before, honestly. From the circular gauges to the gauges in the center stack, just some of the overall design aesthetics here are making that connection. Now, here's where my problem is. I think that this pandering to their history here is holding back modern design in this car. Uh, it's things like the ground speed on the speedometer that's making the connection to the P51 Mustang plane. It's kind of unnecessary. These large center-mounted circular gauges take up a lot of space that could be reserved for usable gauges. And when I'm talking about usable gauges, I don't mean putting uh, an oil pressure gauge and a boost gauge in the center that are almost impossible to read when you're driving in an aggressive manner. There's no peak hold. You can't tell high and low oil pressures, things that you would really need if you were driving this car hardcore. Now, probably the Mustang fans and the Ford fans are probably going to all ready to trash this review, but it's just a commentary on the modern state of the Mustang. Really, it's hard to bridge that gap between old and new and make everybody happy. I, I totally get it. And I know Ford spent a lot of time on the design of this interior, and it really pays off in terms of, in terms of ergonomics and drivability. This is the best Mustang interior yet, from shifter feel to arm placement to armrest to seats to pedal placement to clutch feel. I mean, all the fundamentals are so strong here. Uh, the other area I really like is this digital gauge in the middle how it's implemented and how you get through the menus is one of the best implementations of it yet of any car I've been in. It's simple to get in and out of menus without thinking about it. It's intuitive and that's most important. The center stack controls are really good. The ergonomics are sound. Your volume and tune knobs are just have a really high quality direct feel to them. The HVAC controls, they're all physical. You don't have to use the touch screen to use them and it's very intuitive. The hot and cold rocker is a little small, I'd prefer a knob, but whatever, you're just splitting hairs on that. These toggle switches, which are airplane inspired at the bottom, again, this is just a debate of, do you like the modern or retro throwback? I personally think they're unnecessary, but they do work. You have your mode selection here for your drive mode, which is essentially race or track, sport plus, winter mode, and then normal. You can kind of toggle through on this digital screen. Infotainment. Not going to spend a lot of time on it because this is the last model year that Ford Sync is going to be in Ford vehicles, the Microsoft design system. In the F-150 King Ranch I got out of, it was horrendous. There were times I just turned off the screen and didn't want to deal with it. It was so slow and weird to respond, so glitchy. This is the same implementation in this car, but the difference here in the Mustang is it's not slow. It doesn't lag like it did in that car. So I don't know if it was just a problem with the software on that car needed to be reflashed or updated, I'm not sure. So one of the last two things, storage capacity. Interior storage is pretty adequate. 
the glove box is, has a surprising amount of storage and it's really ergonomically placed the button to push it in to open it up as the driver, which I like. Well thought out. Now conversely, we have this center armrest, which really doesn't have a lot of storage. And not only that, they've decided that the mechanism to open it is going to be in between your seat and the center console. It's actually on the side. So if your seat's farther forward, it's really fidgety to try to open it while you're driving. It reminded me of being, well, 21 years old again, trying to remove a bra with one hand. Last but not least, one of my favorite things that Ford's doing, specifically in the Mustang, is allowing you to customize your gauge cluster lighting and your ambient lighting color because they've implemented LEDs here. Modern age, you shouldn't be stuck with one color anymore. If you're one of those people that don't like me, I don't like ice blue in my interior, I like it more off-white or whitish, you can do that here. You can change it whatever color you want, and that's one of the best suits of this interior. Now all of that's done through this center menu. You can't do it on the infotainment here like on the other Fords, and I'm not sure why. Maybe I'm missing something, but this center cluster is a lot harder to adjust the color than it was on the infotainment before. But not a big deal, you can still do it. The big negative here is your steering wheel controls, your HVAC controls, and your window toggle buttons here are all this off blue color and you can't change them. The LEDs are just one color and all that. So while you have everything else the color you want, you're stuck with this weird blue on everything else and it's one of those oversights and I know it's a cost issue, probably a lot of money to implement uh, adjustable or SMD LEDs and all this stuff. But again, it's something to note. It's a really good implementation for most people. You're gonna like it a lot. Scott, we're here today with two Mustangs. Which ones we got? Hers and hers. Oh, do you think they're two female cars? Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah, I think it's Mustang is just for our females. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think a lot of people are gonna like you. I don't think so. Uh, the, well, we got the man's right here, and that's the women's. This over is there. the four banger, though. I know. Oh, that's the top one? Yeah. That's the one you've been driving, though. Unfortunately. What color did you turn your LED gauge lighting to? Pink. Oh yeah? Mm -hmm. 